Good morning. It is Good Friday, April 10th, 2020. And let's talk a little bit about what's going on for after coronavirus, even though we're not anywhere close to the after. First off, um, we want to talk about the slow growth forever economy and the impact that the coronavirus is having. And what we should consider is this. In the slow growth forever global economy, we know that aging demographics have a massive impact on the growth of the economy. We know that as the average age of the population gets older and people become retired, that spending slows down. And I have some graphics to show you that should make it abundantly clear that the challenges of the aging population um, are significant and that we should not dismiss those as the major macroeconomic theme of our lives. Over the next 20 or 30 years, we are going to continue to see uh, a push-pull uh, relationship between deflation and inflationary policies. The inflationary policies designed to offset the natural deflationary forces of aging demographics that we have seen. If you've never looked up Harry Dent, horrible financial forecaster, but his demographic data is outstanding, I would look up Harry Dent. And he talks a bunch of garbage about things he doesn't understand. But if you stick to his demographics, uh, what you will find is that it's very easy to understand. And those challenges present us with the large, secularly challenged economy that people like Larry Summers, Neil Kashgari, all sorts of smart people keep pointing out. So when you see in the comment section of one of my articles or somewhere else, somebody saying, well, I don't buy into that whole slowing uh, economy, structural, uh, slow growth, uh, aging demographics is mattering, uh, you can dismiss that person as a fool. So we have always known that demographics are destiny. So the velocity of money has been slowing for years. Um, I talked about the need for helicopter money to jumpstart the economy in the last several years. It's happening way sooner than I thought it would happen. I thought that we'd wait for a different crisis, the failure of the retirement system. However, coronavirus has accelerated a lot of things. So now the U.S. Treasury is backstopping the Federal Reserve and is essentially printing money to recharge the economy. Coronavirus is temporary, but not as short-term as many people seem to think. The economy will not recover lost GDP until 2020-22. Um, in 2020, uh, we will see a shrinkage of the GDP. We'll probably get close to the 2019 levels in 2021, and then we'll finally have legitimate above former peak growth starting in 2022. And this all presumes that there is a vaccine for coronavirus by then. So there's these charts all over the place. This one is from the Census Bureau. And it shows that the uh, growth of the over 65 population is much faster than the growth of the under 18 population. And under 18 is what we really would like to see be the higher number if we were going to grow the population of the planet forever, which of course is a bad idea. So that's another thing that you can dismiss out of hand is people saying, well, we should just have more babies to fix all this. Uh, duh, eventually resources get scarce and we're going to actually run into that in the 2020s due to lack of investment. So we can take a look at a number of things here down the road. But first off, let's understand how the velocity of money works. We had a growing economy 
And then we had a big recession where the growth of money velocity, this is M1, slowed. And through about from Reagan to Clinton, we had velocity of money that was challenged. And this put a hamper on the growth of the economy. And it's not just M1, which is the narrowest sense of money, which is really just the coinage and the dollars. But the broader look at M2 shows that philosophy of money peaked a little bit later, right around the turn of the century. The broadest measure of velocity of money is includes all investable assets, really anything that's tradable. And that's been coming down since the end of the stagflationary period. This is the stagflationary period where we had no growth in GDP, um, but we also had inflation. And ever since then, we've been unwinding things for 40 years. Without growth in the velocity of money, and this is not evil, it's not wrong, it just is. The slower velocity of money leads to slower economic growth. That is why post-financial crisis, we saw so many low GDP growth numbers, two, two, three, four percent, with 4% being the outlier and 2% being the norm. GDP will fall dramatically this year. The last time we had GDP fall year over year was the Great Recession. And here it took two years to set a new high. This time it'll probably take to the third year. So GDP is going to drop in 2020, probably a little bit more than what this says from trading economics. And if you haven't used trading economics, you can log in with a Google account. So if you got a Gmail account and you keep that logged in to uh, sync your browsers, which is what I do, um, you can get a free account at Trading Economics just using your uh, Gmail account. You don't even have to type in uh, email and password or anything. So just go ahead and use your Gmail account to go to tradingeconomics.com. And there are all kinds of data sets that are free. Now, if you want download capability and the ability to use it with Python or different APIs, you have to pay. But the free resources here are really pretty off the charts. Um, it makes uh, getting data on the economy very, very easy for yourself if you want to. So we'll see GDP down here in 2020. In 2021, it'll probably get to about the same level, maybe a shade less. I wouldn't expect a shade more, but a shade less. And then in 2022, we'll probably see new highs. So consider how long it took for the stock market to react here, where we had the initial rally of the stock market in 2009, 10, 11, 12, and then we got a two-year period where it went nowhere. And then we got another two-year year period though it went nowhere, nowhere a couple years later. So what exactly is the Fed and the Treasury doing? Um, oh, got rid of my chief. <laughs> Um, the Fed and Treasury have essentially merged. Uh, President Trump is the CEO and fire chief. Um, I would argue that he helped start the fire, but such is life. Um, expect a fire hose approach. Uh, only Congress can control the misuse of some of the money. Uh, does that mean that all assets are created equal? No. Um, certain assets aren't going to do very well, and we'll get to some of those in a minute. Um, is there more correction to come? Probably. So take a look at this here. Um, I will post this inside of the uh, uh, both services, fundamentaltrends.com and the margin of safety investing service. I'll post this, um, I'm gonna touch it up a little bit this weekend, and then I'll throw it out there tomorrow or Sunday. Um, and I'm going to include lots of things to invest in because I'm going to include the chart book here. Uh, for a number of our uh, top stocks. But the Fed <clears throat> is essentially 
got the treasury to print money for it. So the Fed can go out, and if you took a look at the what they've decided to do here a couple days ago, they are bailing out small businesses left and right. And again, if you are a small business person and you're not taking advantage of this, you're, you're missing out because your competitors are doing this and it's going to put you at a competitive disadvantage. You need to go get this free money while you can because it doesn't happen very often, right? Um, the EDIL program, E-D-I-L, is fantastic for helping you with uh, expenses because your revenues fell. Um, and then the payroll protection program uh, is great to help you pay your employees. And if you're a sole proprietor, um, I'm not going to do this, but you could go out there and backstop your own pay if you've been giving yourself a salary. If you just do draws, it's not gonna help you. But if you've been giving yourself a salary, um, definitely uh, they will help you uh, keep your salary. And it may even be forgivable. Um, at worst, it'll just be taxable income. And if you just take draws, they're talking about, and I haven't seen the guidelines yet, they're talking about um, just letting you use your last year's uh, Schedule C to determine what your income is. Maybe that'll work. But again, you should look at these programs. Um, the debate that just started this week, and you'll notice that I, I ripped on... Um, the shale industry. So not a couple minutes after, literally a couple minutes after, I ripped on shale and said that the final theft in shale was coming because they're going to take all these companies private. Uh, Occidental Petroleum came out and asked for a federal bailout. Why? Because the um, OPEC plus uh, oil cut wasn't as big as everybody wanted it to be, and it's going to be a lot more slow moving because really Russia's contribution is just to stop drilling. They're not going to close anything, neither is Saudi Arabia. So the drop in oil demand is the green line here. Probably take a year to two years get just back to where it was, probably two years, 2022. And the cuts, um, I projected going from 100 down to 95. So I projected, you know, I just guessed, but I, I based it on a range of four to eight million barrels that they would cut. And I'm still going to stick with five because I don't think they'll actually cut all 10 that they promised. And then shale is going to fall off as well. So at the end of the day, um, you probably see total oil production get down to around 94 barrels, 94 million barrels a day for a hot minute at the end of the year. But this glut is massive. It's the biggest glut in history. So it's gonna take a very long time for the price of oil to get to 60 again. Now I do think it's going to go from 20-ish to 40-ish relatively quickly within a year, you know, by next summer. Um, but by then, you're gonna have a lot of shale companies that have gone broke. And I pointed out three stocks in this article, Cell Occidental Petroleum, Cell Hess, Cell Continental Resources. And I think the timing is pretty good because all of these stocks had rallied a little bit um, for about what, two weeks? And they came off their bottoms. Every one of these companies is gonna set a new low. I have no doubt in my mind. Uh, because if you take a look at their finances, they're all essentially broke. Uh, they don't have enough assets to cover their debts. So if you go to Occidental Petroleum here, it says total assets 109 million, long term debt 40 million. And then other liabilities are much higher because you have to take into account production. So just producing cost them more liabilities. Let's take a look at long-term debt minus total assets. 40 billion in long-term debt is real. Total assets of 109 billion is imaginary. If they really had $109 billion in assets, 
don't you think that they could turn around and sell 40% of it and be a debt-free company that just only had 60 billion in assets? The reality is that their assets and the assets of almost everything on here is worth about half, give or take, of what they report. So are they lying? Partially. Uh, but what they're largely not doing is recognizing the value of oil and gas has gone down dramatically. Why? Again, we overproduced and you have alternative energy as the fastest growing source of energy. And that's not going to stop. Also, EVs are coming at, in 2026. The majority of cars for sale will be EVs. Every car company has said so. So unless they're lying and all the billions of dollars they're pouring into changing their uh, plants is wrong uh, and that they're going to reverse course, you're not going to have a lot of internal combustion engine vehicles for sale starting in 2026. That'll probably be the last model year for a lot of cars. And I believe the coronavirus is speeding up this trend as well because you see companies like GM and Ford transitioning some of their factories to help with medical supplies. I have a question. Why would they transition those companies back? If you're the CEO of Ford, right, if you're Henry Clay Ford Jr., whatever his name is, three little initials, you know, Roman numerals. If you were him and you were already worried about, and we've talked about this before, convert, transitioning your company from the old economy to the new economy, Given that you're going to have an oversupply of internal combustion engine cars this year, right? Because sales fell off a cliff. Every lot out there is packed and the factories have all kinds of cars and the parking lots have all kinds of cars. We have all kinds of cars started. Why wouldn't you take this opportunity to start retooling some of your plants to do EVs? And why wouldn't you start laying off people with the expectation that you don't bring them back until production is higher? Keep them on a list, whatever you're going to do. And that's actually what you're going to see in the car industry. And I pivoted to the car industry because I want you to understand something. It's a gigantic industry. It employs a lot of people directly and then indirectly through the supply chain all the parts manufacturers and everything else associated with them. Saying used to be that as GM goes, the American economy goes. GM and Ford are still big components of the American economy and really uh, technology is the most important part of the economy now. But of the blue collar economy, the car industry is gigantic. Tool and die makers across the country, right? All sorts of uh, parts and components companies that if the car industry goes through a transition period that takes a year or two, that means that the all those affiliated jobs, all those indirect jobs are impacted. Millions of people either out of work or making less money. So how does that impact philosophy of money? If we have higher unemployment, which I've talked about before as being the thing to watch for how the economy is going to go in the short run and how the stock market will go. So not only do you have restaurant workers and hotel people and cruise people out of work, but it's a lot of small businesses that were making parts for the auto industry. That's huge. And it's a lot of industries that were on the cusp of having to make a decision about whether to upgrade or retire. And I'm telling you right now, and I've heard this from 15 people at least so far, all people in their 60s and 70s, they have businesses, they're saying, look, I'm going to take all the aid I can get. I'm going to write out the unemployment. I'll try to sell my business, but if not, I'll just sell the real estate. And that is going on across the, uh, just across the economy. 
the transition period for a lot of these companies coincides with the wind down to retirement for a lot of these baby boomer owners. A lot of these businesses are gonna close. So if you are an entrepreneur, it should be nirvana for you. If you just wanna punch a clock, time clock, you better, better make sure that you have some job security. And if you don't, you better take this opportunity because the eight will probably be out there to learn the skills of the fourth industrial revolution of technology, whatever it is that you have some interest and aptitude for, because this is all going to happen way faster. People that thought that they could ride it out for 10 or 15 years because it was going to happen slowly, it's not gonna happen slowly anymore. This two-ish year period is going to be a massive transition that I originally talked about back at CES as taking the whole decade. So the original thought was, don't get frustrated in two years because it's gonna take 10 years for a lot of these things to happen. Now it's flipped around. You need to expect a lot of these things to happen in the next two years. Industry is going to undergo a massive change. They're shut down right now. They're making decisions about the future. And a lot of them are not going to decide. I'm just going to try to go back to the old way and write it out. A lot of them are taking this downtime to reposition for the future. And think about all this debt that's being created that's just going to get poofed away someday. And it's never going to come off the Federal Reserve balance sheet again. Why? Because when they tried to get rid of it, stock market had two years where it didn't do anything. So what they're doing is they're basically bailing out everything investment grade and up. And debt that fell from this level down one level is allowed to participate, which is a lot of debt. So you have a lot of borderline investment grade debt that became junk debt that's still going to be part of these bailouts. It doesn't mean the companies don't have to pay the bill. It just means that they uh, are gonna have a lot easier time doing it. But that doesn't mean they're good companies. As I've identified and been telling you about for months, There are over 100 companies in the S&P 500 that have essentially zero growth and probably never will. I'm going to start shorting these companies uh, at some point. Uh, several of them I think I'm going to short imminently. So you might wanna take a look at fundamental trends. If you're on margin of safety and you're interested in short trades and swing trading, Take the $99 add-on that I set up um, for fundamental trends, and I'm going to put out one or two or three trades every week in an article called Swinging for the Fences. And these are small trades you can make that might have 10 and 20 and 30% upside if we catch the timing right. That means that you're going to fail a lot of times. That means that two out of three trades probably don't work. But the one that does work is gonna more than triple. So we have to look at it as an aggregate game rather than, well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get 90% of my trades right. Well, then you're not gonna make a lot of trades and you're not going to be able to uh, roll for the jackpot. So some of the trades we're going to make are going to be jackpot trades looking to make three, four, five, 10, 20 times your money inside of usually six weeks. The problem is, like I said, two thirds of the bets will just go to zero or, or, or way down quickly. In general, we should make money double to triple the rate of the stock market. if the stock market is normal. 
And that's actually a problem right now because the stock market isn't normal. Right now, we know that the stock market is heavily manipulated by the federal government. And that means that the long-term bias is clearly up. I believe that we have one more wave down coming on this correction. And I have been buying puts on the S&P 500 in the last week, speculating on that. So this is 2008-9, and this is today. Looks very similar. It's just more condensed, correct? This took three quarters. This is going to take three months. So I expect at some time in the next week, to two weeks, but I think, I think this week coming up, the stock market hits its level. It's a new rally mode and it, and it could break out even higher. You know, it could go all the way up to right around here. It could, it shouldn't, but it could, and then drop. So it's either going to get in here and fall, or it's gonna go all the way up to about this level and not be able to push through and then fall. So it's either here or here where this market turns around. According to this research firm, and I tend to agree with them, um, the way the lines work is that you hit in these uh, Bollinger Bands, and that has been a pretty good indicator um, for when things should turn around. So I would expect that you can probably buy puts this week. So which puts? So here's a hedging trade for you. Buy the May S&P 500 puts, buy puts. Strike range of 230 down to 220. I'd probably own more than one. Um, and use your 15 minute chart for the entry. If you don't know what that means, you probably shouldn't do this trade. Buy when the RSI is near overbought, so over 60, closing in on 70. And if you're hedging long positions, you still wanna keep this as less than 10% of your portfolio. And I should have put this in there, but you probably want to have about a four or five to one ratio between short and long. So if you have 30% of your portfolio in long positions in the stock market, you only wanna have four, five, 6% bet in the other direction because these are puts and they're leveraged. If you're mostly in cash, like I know a lot of you are, then you can just maybe put four or 5% to bet against the market. If you believe that this is the one that's going to turn around. Otherwise, if you think we're gonna go a little higher, uh, then you should wait a little longer. So these are the price of some of the puts. You see the 230 put. It's trading for under $3. I got it for $3.40, so I'm a little underwater yet. I, I really need this to turn around soon uh, because I still want to have some um, time value. So right now, here's the four hour chart verify that I had a slide problem earlier. I'll make sure I'm on the four minute chart. There we go. There you go. Yeah. Four hour chart. So you see the four hour chart is overbought. Which means we're getting close to it turning over. On the 15 minute chart, it's not overbought yet. So if it rallies at the start of the day on Monday, probably gets overbought pretty quick. And that would be your signal, signal to buy the puts. Is that easy enough to understand? 
This is getting close to overbought. It's right at overbought. If the market opens up, then you probably get the 15 minute to be overbought as well. So that's what you're looking for, is for the four hour chart, and the 15 minute chart to both be overbought at the same time on the S&P 500. And then I think you can buy the SPY puts. Once we decide to invest again in earnest, and I think that that is coming I think it's coming by July at the latest, July or August at the latest maybe. But I, I really do think we're going to want to be invested probably by the end of July pretty fully, be my guess. Lots of crazy things can still happen. Anybody who's gonna tell you exactly how things are gonna happen, they're blowing smoke up your ass. The probable outcome here is that we have more choppiness, not a rocket ship to the moon, because coronavirus still has a lot of bad news out there. I've showed you the John Hopkins chart before. It hasn't really turned over yet. It's still increasing. So think of this like the slow growth of oil demand Coronavirus increase in infections is slowing, but the increase in infections hasn't gone down yet. Coronavirus infections are still increasing. We need this line to turn over because then it means the rate of coronavirus infections is decreasing. So right now the rate is still increasing. It's just increasing at a slower rate. We really need this curve to point down. This is the initial ramp up, plateaued. It looked like it was gonna turn over here. It didn't, it started going back up again. What we don't want is for this curve to look like it's plateauing and then turn back up again. If it does, then maybe we get to those lower levels on the stock market that I had originally talked about. They're not out of play. It's not impossible for the stock market to set new lows and go way down here to 19, 18, 17, 1600 on the SPY. If we have a setback with coronavirus, that's what will happen. If we're smart, we keep the economy shut down till the end of May, and then probably go to the point where um, we allow everything except groups over 50. So groups over 50 probably not allowed until there's a vaccine, um, but anything up to that probably allowed and probably going to have to limit certain things. But I think, you know, we can get to the point where if that curve gets put all the way on the ground, that's when you get your um, groups over 50 again. That's when baseball opens up. That's when casinos open up. And there's a possibility that can happen over the summer if we're not stupid and try to open up too fast. And consider all this money, which is going to be inflationary, why do that if we're just gonna let the disease come back? We need to beat it to the ground, make it scarce, and then come up with a vaccine as quickly as possible. And again, I know some of you hear these things about herd immunity. There are a lot of diseases where there is very little to no herd immunity without a vaccine. This disease seems to reoccur either by laying dormant, like HIV, or you just get it again, like any other cold. We don't know which it is yet, but we know that this thing, you can get it more than once, or, that, or you just never got rid of it. So it's important 
that we beat down the transmission as much as possible and then come up with a vaccine. In a perfect world, you know, we can come up with a vaccine by November. I think that the odds of that happening are extreme long shot, but it's possible uh, because we do know that there will be two to four vaccines being tested right around, they're going to start right around Labor Day. I mean, they're making very quick progress on this, relatively speaking. I don't know that I want to be the first one to get a shot. Um, but I think that we're, we're, we're going to be to the point where we're getting vaccinated within a year. You're 18 months on the outside, but I think within a year, and I still think that although November is aggressive, I could definitely see them taking a shot at that. Right, the early, your early people might be able to get the shots in November. We'll see. Uh, December, January, February, much more likely, and about this time next year, even more likely. So, I would think that at some point we're getting these shots along with our flu shots. In any case, this is typical of what happens. Three waves down, um, and it. It can be five waves down, um, but I don't think that happens unless we have a setback in the health. All the companies in the S&P 500 um, that are worth shorting, uh, I think that'll be a primary focus of fundamental trends going forward is we know what we want our long investments to be, right? Our long investments are going to be in the smart everything world, alternative energy, and then some gold and resources. So this is really what we're going to focus on on the long side. Way heavy over here, right? This is gonna be way over half of our money. This is gonna be 20, 30% of our money. And that's if you like the gold story as much as I do because of the uh, money printing that I just showed you. But these zombie companies, I tell you, hey, I just love the picture. See, this is all the zombie companies reaching out for money. This is the oil executives reaching out for money. This is some of the bankers reaching out for money. This is the hotel companies asking for money. The cruise companies asking for money, right? The airlines asking for money after they did buybacks for eight years. Boeing asking for money after they did buybacks. And then they screwed up uh, one of their, their major product, right? So I, I do want you to keep this in mind. Some of the companies getting money, even without coronavirus, they had screwed up. I told you before coronavirus that Boeing was going to go under 200. What, and I think it was 400 when I first said it. I told you the airlines had a comeuppance coming too. I travel enough to know that the airlines were starting to struggle. So understand that this short-term boost that they're going to get from the stimulus or from this bailout, or relief, whatever you want to call it, is going to open up some opportunities for us to short the shit out of some of these crappy zombie companies. Certain companies will rebound, like Delta. I want Delta when I can get it. You know the reasons why. There's not a single other airline that I want. I like Ford. I, I don't like GM. You know the reasons why. If you're a subscriber, you know the reasons. So I think that's all we have for today. I think that this should be very self-explanatory about what's going on. It's just a matter of how far does this counter trend rally go? Is it about done? Does it go up a few hundred more points on the S&P 500 to this 3,100 level? All right, this is where I told you a week ago that it could go. This makes more sense. 
And here's the thing, if it goes to here, think of something falling off of a table, it gathers, it gains velocity, right? So from way up here, much more likely to get the terminal velocity and crash through this level. Especially if the economy doesn't turn around faster than people's already inflated expectations are. In this zombie group, there are a lot of office REITs. Um, there are a lot of uh, uh, restaurant chains. There are hoteliers. Um, I think that certain companies that thought we're going to IPO um, at these amazing valuations are not going to be able to IPO at those valuations. And if they do IPO and have a rise, you're gonna to wanna to short them because they're gonna do what Facebook did when the, it came out and crash. You know, I'll, I'll throw out a company, Airbnb. Airbnb is not worth anywhere near what they say it's worth. Not even close. And in fact, I am unlikely to ever use an Airbnb again. I have one reservation for Vegas if I get my money back, I'll get my money back. Um, I'm never going to do Airbnb again, except maybe for some luxury stuff. Um, if there's a special place I want to go. The medium to low end Airbnb is in massive trouble. Why? Because there's going to be so much hotel capacity as the baby boomers start to die off and they've already overbuilt that the hotels are going to be very competitive. Airbnb is toast, as far as I can tell. You know, Verbo, which is the higher end, I think is, 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 is fine. I mean, take a look at some of the Verbo properties. But other industries are in big trouble. Um, industries where they have to go through huge, expensive transitions are in trouble. But there's usually one or two cherries that you can pick out, be long, without having to be anywhere else in the industry. I think the automakers are like that. I think you can trade Tesla, and I think you can buy Ford at some point. Maybe now, maybe down a buck, I don't know, but soon. The rest of the auto industry, they have to spend an awful lot of money. You know, and I, I just think that the American economy is going to be so much better than everybody else's over the next 10, 20 years, uh, with the exception of a handful of small caps. I wanna find here, this chart. See Japan, China, and Europe? They're in big trouble. I mean, we have problems. They have trouble. Their populations are so old, there's no way they can take care of them without having to print a lot of money. And in this world, um, printing money is inflationary, just like it would be in anywhere else in the galaxy. It's just, it's less inflationary for the United States. And those relationships aren't going to change very quickly. The United States is still the best place to have money or invest, relatively speaking, to anybody else. Our economy is that much better. There's just really no other way to put it. So no matter how we got here, and there were several reasons coming out of World War II, the certain things that we did over the decades, you know, including the petrodollar, um, it doesn't even matter that the petrodollar is going away. It just it doesn't matter because oil is going away, so who cares? So in a world that's not reliant on oil, or is less and less reliant on oil going forward, the real strength of a currency is the entirety of the underlying economy. And the United States economy is just so much better than everybody else's. If you ever doubt that, if you ever doubt that, travel. Seriously, travel. Nobody's got our economy. I mean, there's small countries that do, Singapore, right, Switzerland, but there's really no big country on the planet 
that could become the reserve currency the way we are. Now, we have shored up the IMF, and I'm certain that the strategic, uh, the special drawing rights are coming back, but that's still largely dollars. So the fact that so many people in the world want dollars, that's what keeps our inflation from getting completely out of hand. So in a world where everybody prints money, we can print money to them because it's relative. Now, if you are a non-investor, you better hope that wages go up. And if wages go up, that means as an investor, you have to be more selective because certain companies won't have extra money to throw off to shareholders. And I think that's very important, that point right there at the end, and we'll finish with that. We should want more people to engage in the economy as consumers so that velocity of money goes up. We're almost to the bottom of where it can be. I mean, you can't go below one. Pretty low. This curve in the next few years, especially with all this money being printed, if wages go up as a part of this deal, this curve will go up slowly, but it'll be good for everybody. Now, investors won't get the free ride that they've come to enjoy the last decade. Um, investing will be harder. Price discovery will become more frequent. I mean, we, we haven't had price discovery in the stock market for years. Print money, stocks go up. Print money, real estate goes up. Print money, stocks goes up. Print money, real estate goes up. Oh, economic event, catastrophe, coronavirus. Stop half the economy in its tracks. Change the way that we do work. I guarantee you, that working from home is going to double or triple now. That's gonna reduce miles driven. That's gonna change the way people eat, right? Because if you're gonna be at home every day, you're gonna learn how to make a sandwich. Sure, you might still sneak out for a coffee here and there, sometimes go out for lunch. But having worked from home now for a few years, I'll tell you what, I eat at home almost every day. I go out for lunch once a week, coffee once a week. Make my own coffee. Bought a ninja, right? Look at what's going to be behind the work from home, smart everything, and alternative energy economies. That's where the growth is. That's where the money is. That's where the cash is going to be on the balance sheets that can be thrown off to shareholders. Look what Apple just did. Somehow they're making masks. Fourth industrial revolution companies, they have smart machines, machines that can learn AI, right? You can turn a car factory into a ventilator factory. That's where the money will be made. Fourth industrial revolution, smart everything world, alternative energy, biotech, all the things that we've talked about. All right, I hope everybody has a great Easter. This too shall pass. Um, and there's really a lot of money to be made here. And I am frankly at that point in my life where I just wanna make a lot of money. So you are catching me at 25 years of experience, overeducated for what I do and hungry. So keep an eye out for the Swinging for the Fences articles of Fundamental Trends because, uh, you know, my boy, you know, Chinos is from the Milwaukee area, so I got to impress him. Um, there's also going to be some trades with our long investments where we can take a little bit of leverage. So we will take a look there and, um, and we'll keep up on it. Uh, I know that Easter celebrations might be a little subdued this year, so hide some extra candy for the kids. My girlfriend and I are going to hide candy for each other, maybe play a little game. 
um, have a couple extra eggs and uh, you know have a good day and you know watch some classic uh, baseball on TV. Take care everybody.